minutes ago. Uh, we, we went long, and so I'll get this put on here in a minute. Um, but let me uh, take a look here at our announcements and, and make some announcements to get started with. Um, first of all, you see that we're decorated for VBS, uh, and that's uh, coming up very soon. Uh, in fact, today is the last day to register, so if you have kids to register, register them uh, today, and then uh, VBS will be coming up on Saturday. And then our block party will be this next Sunday. So those two things will be back to back. Uh, but there are some sign-up sheets uh, for helping with both of those. Uh, but again, uh, with the registration for VBS, uh, that's on our church website. Uh, what else? Any other announcements that need to be made? Like I said, I just kind of jumped up here. So I was told that uh, we have a presentation from Children in Action. So how about we just have them go ahead and come on up? Okay, so we came to you at the beginning of August, and we asked for the church to help us to give to Sal and Giovanni Garavate, and with the church's help, we have come up with the following. So, Anne, I mean, not Anna, Emma, <laughs> sorry is going to start and she's going to read and we're going to tell you what we came up with. What's your sign say? Thank you. Isabel? Sixth grade Sunday school donation. $81.32. Anonymous donor. $25. Total donation. $350. Lemonade stand, $60.94. And the noisy offering was $182.74. So what we wanted to show you was that with the total of the whole church coming together from the children in action to the sixth grade class to the noisy offering, um, everyone came together and we are going to donate a Walmart gift card to this family in the amount of $350 so they can help with um, missions in South Florida. And so I think this is great to show that all the different generations have come together in our church to raise $350 in missions for their cause. So let's just remember that when we all come together, what we can do for missions, not only abroad, but even here in our own community. So thank you all. Deacons is going to come forward now and share with us some prayer requests. Good morning. Good morning. Prayer requests we have this morning. Uh, we have one for Dawson Brown. 
He's going to be having dental surgery on Tuesday. We also have prayer concerns for the Marilyn Harrison family during this time of their loss. Robert and Joyce McDonald, that is the aunt and uncle of Greg Cooper, uh, experiencing serious health issues. Phyllis Rice is in the hospital, very ill. She has shown some slight improvement. Also want to keep the prayers in uh, for the Vacation Bible School coming up this next Saturday. And also ask that you continue to pray for the health of our country. All right. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I need to take some time to quiet my spirit before God. And uh, this is our opportunity to do that. So I want to invite you to just uh, take this time uh, for silent prayer to lift up these prayer requests uh, to God, uh, but also anything that may be on your heart specifically. And uh, this is the time for us to prepare our hearts for worship. So let's do that. God, we love you. We thank you for how gracious you are to us, all the many blessings that we have. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. We pray, Lord, that uh, this morning that our eyes will be fixed upon Jesus, even as we have many different struggles, many different burdens that we face. I pray, Lord, that we will entrust those things to you, pray that uh, perhaps will give us a glimpse of how you're working in and through those things. But most of all, we want to see Jesus this morning. We want to see uh, your glory and grace through Christ. So I pray for that, Lord. I pray that you will be among us in a special way as we sing, as we pray, as we look to your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be here with you all this morning in worship. And uh, as we sing this morning, we're going to be singing about the, the glory and greatness of God. We're going to be singing about the, uh, the sacrifice, the, the mediation that Jesus does on our behalf before the Father and of worshiping him and adoring him. And, and it all comes back to our relationship and our uh, position before the Lord in Christ that we have in spite of the fact that we're sinners uh, I want to share with you just some verses here that I think often refresh me and remind me of what worship uh, truly is. Isaiah 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from, uh, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And with that, if you would stand and let's worship the Lord this morning. Sing a new song. 
song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Sing that again. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song.
or any um, ulterior motives or anything, God, that would cause us to be led away from truly worshiping, worshiping you this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just drive that out, Lord. Help us to focus fully and completely on you, upon the work that you have done for us in Christ, and just who we are in you, and that we would be able to worship you right this morning. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. And if you would continue worshiping with us together with hymn number 24, O Worship the King. Worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield. Thank you. 
you guys an honest question, okay? I want you to be honest with me. How do these look, Harvey? They look, you can be honest. You don't have to worry about crushing my feelings. How, how do they look? You guys aren't answering. Your, your silence doesn't make me feel very good. How do they? How do they? Ter terrible. Okay, we need to be honest. They look terrible. These, these are my wife's sunglasses, by the way. I would never, I would never wear these out in public, but what what is the purpose typically of sunglasses? Okay, very good. So they keep us from getting our eyes hurt from the sun, right? So now, does that mean that I can look like directly at the sun with these on? No, right? I still have to be wise, right? I don't want to look at the sun and, and get my eyes burned out. But it does help still kind of keep the rays out of my eyes. So if I were to look directly at the sun, what do you think would happen? I would become blind or my eyes would be severely damaged. That is not something you ever want to do. So, so that's, that's part, part of the reason why we would wear sunglasses, right? Is to protect our eyes from the sun. That's also why we wear sunscreen, right? Because we don't want to get a really bad sunburn. We don't want our, our skin to be hurt. So, so we, put, we, we take different measures to protect ourselves from the sun, right? All right, I'm going to take my, the glasses off now because I think they're a little bit of a distraction. You guys get the point. But uh, So this morning in the sermon that, uh, that Chad is going to be preaching, Brother Chad, he's, he's going to be talking about this story where Moses is on the mountain with God, and he's talking to God, and he asks God to show him his glory. Now that's a pretty crazy request, but that's something that Moses asked for. Now basically what God told Moses is what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, which basically means he just kind of tucked him away in the rocks, and I'm going to cover you with my hand so that, so that you, when I pass by, I'll take my hand off and you can see my back, okay? Now, we talked about how God is a spirit. He doesn't necessarily have a back, but it's kind of talking in words so that we can understand. But it says, God says, no one can see my face and live. So he wasn't going to show Moses his face, because he wasn't going to be able to live. Moses wasn't going to be able to live if he saw it. Now, can it, does anybody know why would it have killed Moses if he saw God's face? Any, uh, you've answered a call. I'll, I'll call on you if nobody... Does anybody else want to try to give it a shot? Why would Moses have died if he saw God's face? Um, well, that yeah, but there's a, there's a reason why... That there's something about God that makes it so that we can't look at him in our, in our sinful state. <laughs> okay, so, all right, you want to you wanna give, it a, give it a shot? He, he is really bright, so the Bible does say that God dwells in unapproachable light, so it's this idea of he's very bright, and, and that's kind of what we mean when we say he's glorious, right? He's, he's beautiful and bright, and it, and it would hurt our eyes if we saw him, but there's something else. Do you guys know what I mean when I say God is holy? 
Can you, can you, can you tell, what does it mean to be holy? He does love people. That, that is very true. And when we say that he's holy, that basically means that he is completely different than us. So we're sinful and, and we have all kinds of problems because of our sin, because of our disobedience. But God is perfect. And he has all power and all glory and all majesty. And, and that's hard for us to understand. But, but basically, because we're sinful and God is holy, that means that we can't even look on him because we would die. It would, it would take our very life away. And so, similarly to the way that we have to protect our eyes when we're looking at the sun, Moses had to be protected. God had to cover him so that he wouldn't die from seeing God's face because God is so holy. And that, that just speaks to how awesome and amazing and incredibly great God is. And he's the same God today as he was back then. So when we say that you can have a relationship with God through Jesus... It's not a different God than what the one Moses was talking to in the Old Testament. It's the same God who is so glorious and so great and so mighty and does all of these amazing, wonderful things. Yes? That is exactly right. Jesus Christ did die on the cross for us. And that's so that we can have peace with that God, right? Even though we're sinners, that we, we have peace with God through Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to pray for you guys, and then we will be finished. So let's pray. Father, I do just thank you for these children. And Lord, I thank you. Uh, for, for your love for them. And God, I pray that even though you are holy God uh, and, and no one can look on you and live in our sinfulness, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you have provided Jesus for us to make us righteous and to make it so that we can approach you with confidence, Lord. And I pray that each and every one of these children would know you as Lord and Savior God, that you would work in their hearts, that you would draw them to yourself and change their lives forever. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Amen.
hope you open with me to Exodus 33. We'll be in the last part of chapter 33 and the first part of chapter 34 this morning. And I've titled this sermon, Show Me Your Glory. And that's what we see Moses' request of the Lord here in this text. He asked the Lord to show him his glory. Of course, that should be the desire of all of us, shouldn't it? To, to see God's glory, to behold God's glory. God's glory is, after all, what we were created for. Listen to Isaiah 43, 6-7. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone called by my name and created for my glory whom I have indeed formed and made. You see that we were created for God's glory. And we were created not only to behold God's glory, but to display it, right? We are to be lights in this world, right? You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so we display God's glory. But of course, there is an order here to it, isn't, isn't there? That... In order to display God's glory, we first do need to behold God's glory. So we read in this account um, that, that Moses, he beholds the glory of God. And, uh, and, and what we need to understand as Christians, this is kind of a spoiler, all right? And that is that we behold an even greater glory than Moses. That is the glory of God in Christ Jesus question is, will we gaze upon it, or will we turn our eyes toward other things? So the context here in Exodus is, uh, we've, we've had the, what was called the golden calf episode, right, where the people uh, have made for themselves an idol uh, out of gold to worship a calf, and uh, well, that, uh, that's not a very good choice, right? And so when Moses comes down, uh, he sees what has happened. Uh, he breaks the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. And, um, well, we, we see some conversations that, the, that Moses has with the Lord. The Lord says that he will not go up among the people uh, because of their sin. But then Moses, he intercedes uh, for the people, and the Lord agrees to go with them. And so then we get to verse 18. Verse 18 is where it says, Moses said, please show me your glory. You see two parts this morning. The first part is God's glory revealed through power. So that's chapter 33, verses 18 through 23. And the second is God's glory revealed through proclamation. And that's chapter 34, verses 1 through 9. So we're going to break it up a little bit this morning. So I won't have you stand each time as I read the scripture this morning. Uh, but let's begin uh, by reading this first part in Exodus 33. So God's glory revealed through power. Uh, follow along with me if you would. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 18. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. God, as we look at this passage of Scripture and as we continue on through this text and we see this uh, revelation of your glory that you give to Moses, God, I pray that we will behold your glory even as we read this, but then especially as we think of the glory of God revealed in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we will be in awe of it. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue to do your work in us by your Spirit uh, into transforming us and to uh, those who would not only behold, but also display your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, so this first heading is God's glory revealed through power. But, uh, but what we see here is, is just simply God telling Moses what will happen, and he's giving some instructions to Moses. Uh, but the emphasis is, is largely on the, the power of this revelation, the power of this manifestation that we will see in God. So verse 19, let me read verse 19 again. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and, you, and will proclaim before you, my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So notice here there is an emphasis, an emphasis on God's goodness and grace, right? I will make my goodness pass before you. There, there's an emphasis on this, but there's also an emphasis here on God's own initiative. And that phrase, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You'll remember when we were looking at uh, the incident in uh, chapter 32, uh, this, this episode of the golden calf, that um, w when Moses has uh, an initial discussion with the Lord, when he's still on the mountain, um, I, I noted that there's maybe a false impression that, that we might get from that conversation. It almost seems on the surface as if Moses is like trying to talk God down, right? Like, like, uh, like he's trying to reason with the Lord, and then, and then the Lord relents. But understand, he doesn't change his mind in the same way that man does. Uh, so so there, there's some considerations we have to make as we're looking at that text. And I, I think what we see here is... Uh, the fact that God does indeed take the initiative on his own terms. Uh, we do see a, a sovereignty and power expressed through this phrase, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And so on one hand, we see this intercession on Moses. Uh, we see it on the mountain and we also just see it from our text last week in, in uh, chapter 33. We see Moses in these couple of instances interceding on behalf of the people and, and, and mediating between uh, the people and, and God. And, and so, so we see that, but we also see that uh, this all does, in the end, come on the Lord's terms. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, when your kids might ask you why. Uh, like if you tell them to do something, and you say, well, because I told you so, right? Or, or, if they, or maybe asking why about, you know, who knows what. They ask why about a million things, don't they? And so sometimes I might just say, well, because I'm your dad, and that's what I've decided. Uh, that's kind of what the Lord is saying here, right? He, he's saying, I'm God, and I will do as I please. So again, we, we, we see this goodness and this mercy and this grace emphasized, uh, in this passage, we also see God's own initiative emphasized. Uh, Paul quotes this um, line from the Lord in Romans chapter 9. So in Romans chapter 9, uh, Paul had just illustrated uh, what he calls God's purpose of election in choosing Jacob over Esau before either was born or before either of them did anything good or bad. And listen, uh, in Romans 9, verses 14 through 16, this is where Paul quotes our passage from this morning. Uh, Paul, speaking of his purpose of election, he says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So this is a reminder to us that, that God doesn't owe us anything. Right? Sometimes, sometimes people can talk as if God you know, owes us all mercy or something. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? He doesn't owe us mercy. He doesn't owe us grace. By definition, that is undeserved. He doesn't owe us anything. And so when a poor sinner is saved by God's mercy and grace, all glory goes to God. And that's what we see in Exodus. That's what we see there in Romans chapter 9. And so, so we see that God is gracious, that he's merciful, that he's compassionate, but it comes on his terms. And God has some other terms uh, here as he's speaking with Moses, specifically for this revelation of his glory that he would give to him. And so in verse 20, he says this, 
But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So, of course, this is the verse that Alex uh, talked about in the truth time. And there's a lot of power to this, right? Remember, here, here we see, I think, an emphasis of, of the, the uh, glory of God displayed through power. And, and that is this, this, manif- this manifestation uh, of God's glory that Moses will see. Uh, there's going to have to be some parameters here, right? Because if God just displayed uh, his full glory to Moses, if Moses were to see God's face, as it were, uh, he would not be able to live. That's, that's huge, right? right? And, and, so, and so God sets some parameters, right? He says, he says okay, so Moses, I'm, I'm going to put you in, in the cleft of a rock. And then I'm going to cover you with my hand as I pass by. And then only after I pass by and my, and my back is visible, you see my back. And again, we've talked already about how, uh, how these are um, what we might call anthropomorphisms. God, God uh, presenting himself in, uh, in human terms, right? Um, so, uh, so, so, so God says that he's only going to be able to see his back. And as limited as that is, it, it seems that God is intending to give Moses as much of a glimpse of his glory as possible. That is, at least as, any, as far as any visual manifestation is concerned. Right? Uh, so, so with all these parameters, right, this is just so Moses doesn't drop dead. But, but being in the cleft of the rock with, with God's hand covering Moses and until he passes by and only his back is seen, even that, that's huge. Okay? So we see... Uh, this, this glimpse of God's glory that, uh, that Moses will see up on the mountain. But God would reserve an even greater kind of glory for another time and place. That's in Jesus Christ. But again, as, as, we, as we think about this text, this is not to minimize the glory that we see here because make no mistake, this revelation to Moses, it's, it's dramatic, it's intense, it's powerful. Um, this is kind of similar, you know, we talked uh, about uh, last week how Moses would, would meet with God in the tent of meeting and speak with him face to face as a man speaks with his friend. So we talked about how, how really these are figures of speech because uh, we, we see just within a few verses uh, that Moses is speaking with God, quote, face to face, but man cannot see God's face and live. Uh, nevertheless, that passage is expressing this kind of intimacy that, that uh, Moses had with the Lord. And so that, that itself is, is incredibly powerful. But now we see the, more of this visual manifestation where he is, in fact, able to see God's back, or the glory of God's back. And, uh, and, and this, this is a dramatic, intense, and powerful revelation of God. Uh, maybe a revelation of, of a different kind uh, than what we will see 1,400 years later. But what we see 1,400 years later um, is uh, much more glorious. 1,400 years later, we see a first century Jewish man comes on the scene. He's born into a humble family under the most humble of circumstances from an itty-bitty town called Nazareth. And yet, uh, he lived for years as a refugee in Egypt before he was even able to call Nazareth his home. And then after being raised in obscurity uh, as a carpenter's son, now about 30 years old, this man begins his public ministry as an itinerant rabbi. He has no place to lay his head. And his inauguration was a baptism by none other than John the Baptist, a man who lived in the wilderness and wore camel's hair and, and ate locusts. But then what does John the Apostle John say of him in John 1.14, says, And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We, we see in Jesus Christ um, God's glory revealed in, in the greatest way ever. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite different though, isn't it? quite different than, than this powerful visual manifestation that Moses was to see on the mountain. But despite uh, this unassuming physical appearance and, and circumstances, we see that in this man, Jesus, in this man, who is the God-man, right, the Word made flesh, in this man was life, and that life was the light of men. And so in Jesus, uh, we see not just a momentary manifestation, 
We see something that's more powerful, that, that, that's more than a powerful visual display accompanied by a proclamation. We see in Jesus a, a human person who was the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we ought to behold the glory of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus. So as we, as we look at this passage in Exodus and we think, oh, how incredible it must have been for Moses to, to, to see this powerful display of God's glory, we understand that, that, in, that in Jesus, yes, it's very much different, but, uh, but, but much greater. And so we are to turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We all know that song. It's, it's a beautiful song, and, and I think it uh, uh, speaks to what I want to say in the sermon this morning as we think about the glory of God revealed to Moses and then ultimately to us. You know, we all have, uh, at times, spiritual ups and downs. Uh, that's true even for pastors. You know that? Uh, that even, even pastors have uh, spiritual ups and downs. And uh, just if I can be a, a little bit vulnerable to you, um, I want you to know, these past couple of months for me, um, I, I feel as though I have beheld the glory of God in Christ Jesus in a very special way. And so that is to say that maybe a couple of months ago, it wasn't so much that, right? Uh, there, there are ups and downs even in a pastor's life. Um, but but the, the Lord has, has really been working in me these, these past couple of months, especially. And, and I, I, just, I just feel like I, I see things differently. Do you, you ever come to those points in your life to where uh, maybe the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of God's glory and grace? Man, that's, that, that's been true for me. And, 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 and when we're in those, uh, uh, we have that, those moments of clarity, we ought to pray and say, Lord, I don't, I don't want this to fade. I, 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 want, I want to press on and continue in this. And by God's grace, as, as I mature as a Christian, I, I, I pray that those stretches will be longer and longer and that, and that those down times will uh, be uh, maybe less and less dramatic or um, you know, that, 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 we, that we would continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the goal for us all, isn't it? And so, um, turn your eyes upon Jesus. So I, I pray, I, I pray that, uh, that you uh, will do that even this morning. So we see God's glory revealed through power in, in Moses, in this, in this revelation that's going to be given to Moses. And again, we don't downplay that. We recognize, wow, this, this is an incredible thing. Um, but uh, we, should, uh, we should be thankful that uh, we live on this side of the cross. And that uh, even though we maybe didn't uh, see Jesus face to face as he lived here on this earth, Maybe we didn't uh, walk alongside him. Uh, we, we can read about him in the word and we have his spirit living in us, which is a very powerful thing. And so when, when, we, when we read the word and, 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 we, and we see Christ in all of it, right? Uh, and, and as we uh, do that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can behold the glory of God. So number two, God's glory revealed through proclamation. So uh, we'll look at now Chapter 34, verses 1 through 9. So here we see uh, the actual revelation of God's glory to Moses. Uh, but there's an emphasis here on uh, the proclamation that God makes when he reveals himself to Moses. So verse 34, beginning in chapter, uh, chapter 34, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which he broke. Be ready by the morning and come up, to the mor uh, come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one uh, be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no fox or herds graze oppos uh, opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. 
And the Lord descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and he worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. So we see uh, in verse 1 that uh, Moses um, is, is uh, told to make these new tablets. And then in verses 2 and 3, he's given instructions for coming up on the mountain. No one is to come with him, just as, just as before. In fact, there's not even to be any flocks opposite of the mountain. Right? This, this is the holiness of God that's going to be displayed. Um, uh, verse 4, Moses, uh, he does this, he's instructed, he goes up there with the two tablets. And then in verse 5, we see uh, this proclamation. Verse 5 says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now remember uh, what the word LORD in all caps signifies, right? This is telling us that uh, the, this is the personal name of God, Yahweh, okay? And so he declares Yahweh. Now do you remember what Yahweh means? Yahweh, um, it, it comes from the Hebrew to be verb. It sounds very much like I am. And so remember when uh, God first revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And God says, tell him I am sent you. And so uh, Yahweh is, is kind of derived from that. Okay, And, and so, so this is the personal name of the Lord. This, this is a holy name. And so God declares his name, Yahweh, to Moses. But he doesn't only say that. Uh, but uh, in verses 6 through 7, we have this fuller proclamation. And so, uh, let me just read verse 6 to begin with. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't, isn't that a, a beautiful proclamation that the Lord makes of himself? You know, God is often uh, mischaracterized, sometimes even by Christians, uh, especially when he's looked at through an Old Testament lens. Right? So, so people can get the idea that maybe God's a little bit grumpy. And uh, with the surface level reading of the Old Testament, I can, I can kind of understand that. Right? We see in the Old Testament a lot of judgment is dished out. Right? We see that. Um, but first of all, we have to understand that the people deserved every bit of it and more. But second, we also need to understand that the Old Testament takes place over a period of thousands of years. And so even though we might see these, these judgments being dished out, there are centuries uh, in which God does not deliver judgment, often judgment that the people deserve. Now, we've seen in Exodus some judgment dished out, haven't we? But how much more have we seen God continue to patiently guide and provide for and protect his people, despite their ingratitude and their lack of faith. I mean, goodness, we, we, we saw right, right after the people uh, were freed from Egypt, they start complaining, and they, they even say they want to go back to Egypt where they have better food, and, and you know, God is providing for them miraculously, and, and, and they, they show this ingratitude, this lack of faith, uh, but God uh, continues to guide them, provide for them, and to protect them. God is patient with his people. And he's not only patient with his people, but he's even patient with pagans. In Genesis 15, 16, when, when, when God is, is promising uh, to Abraham uh, this land that his uh, descendants would later possess, right? This is the land that the people of Israel are, are heading to, the promised land, uh, what was the land of Canaan. When, when uh, God promises that to Abraham, um, he, he tells him that, okay, you're not going to take it quite yet. It's, it's going it's to take some time. <clears throat> and he says, They shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. 
because of course this was occupied land. And so um, whenever the people of Israel come into the promised land, uh, there's some blood. Right? There are some battles that take place. And this is God's judgment upon the people. But, but, but God waited. He said, he said the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Uh, but it came, it came to a head. Uh, they, they were uh, a very pagan nation that even uh, took part in child sacrifice, things like that. Very, very wicked people. And so God does bring judgment upon them through the people of Israel. But he waited and he waited. God is patient even with pagans. And that patience continues even to this day. Listen to Romans 2.4 in the New Testament. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So for the unbeliever, maybe the unbeliever here in this room, or, 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 or uh, certainly in this community, people that you know, uh, that you love, every breath that a sinner takes is by the sheer grace of God. It is, it is God's kindness, his, his patience, His forbearance. And it is meant to lead one to repentance. But if we read on there in, in Romans 2, the, ne the next verse tells us that those who do not respond with repentance, that they are storing up within themselves the wrath of God, the wrath of God against them. But uh, as long as we are all breathing, we all have the opportunity to repent and to turn to God. And it's really true of all of us. Every breath that we take, it's, it's by the sheer mercy and grace of God. God is demonstrating that He is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God relates especially to his covenant people in this way, that is, covenant people of Israel, but then even us who are in Christ Jesus, uh, especially when we see this word steadfast love and faithfulness. Uh, we, we see that this is um, specifically for those who belong to God. But understand, just as, as, as we look at this proclamation, we see here the character of God in a nutshell. And, and this, this is a very, very important passage in Scripture, right? Um, of course, all passages are important, but, but, but some do carry more weight, in a sense. And this is one of those. So understand, this, this is a very significant passage in Scripture. This, this uh, wording that we see in verse 6, it is repeated numerous times throughout Scripture, which I think supports what, I, what I've said, that this is really the character of God in a nutshell. So you want to know who God is? Right, especially those who might say, "Oh, well, God, he, he's just uh, you know uh, this 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 grumpy deity who who wants to dish out judgment to all those who cross him." Well, if you want to know the character of God in a nutshell, uh, this is it: the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And these words, again, they're repeated numerous times throughout the scriptures. Numbers fourteen eighteen. Nehemiah 9, 17, Psalm 86, 15, Psalm 103, verse 8, Psalm 145, verse 8, Joel 2, 13, Jonah 4, 2, Nahum 1, 3. Of course, in our text this morning, uh, all these passages um, repeat these, uh, these words here in verse 6. So we, so we see the weight that, that these words carry. Right? God has uh, proclaimed his glory uh, through these words to Moses and to us. So then what about verse 7? Because verse 7 continues the proclamation. So really verse 6, that's what we see repeated again and again and again. But, but there's more to it. Verse 7 says, Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So first of all, at the first part of this, at least, we see even more grace, right? We see steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, transgression of sin. But then as, as that moves on, we see uh, something that, I don't know, maybe it, it sounds a little bit troubling to you. 
Um, he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children's children, uh, on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This, this last part uh, is actually uh, a somewhat of a repetition of uh, the Lord from the Ten Commandments. So concerning graven images, Exodus 25, uh, the Lord says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Now that's something that's a little bit different there in, in Exodus 20, verse 5, of those who hate me. Um, we see that uh, the, the guilty that the Lord will not clear, well, it is those who hate him. I think we can uh, kind of fit those two things together. And so, so, those, so those who are guilty, those uh, by, who by the Lord's will no means clear, uh, those who hate him, says that uh, he will visit the iniquity of the fathers in the third and the fourth generations. Um, I don't know for sure exactly what this means. But here's what I do know. I do know that the Bible is a little bit more collectivistic than we are as Americans. And so uh, we actually, uh, Alex and Ray talked about this just uh, a little bit this past Sunday night, about when you go to different cultures, you have kind of uh, individualistic cultures versus collective cultures. So uh, you know, here in America, we're kind of more individualistic where we just focus on the single person, but in other cultures, it's like on the family or on the community. Well, certainly the culture of the Bible is, uh, is more collective than at least our culture in the sense that sometimes in the Bible you do see like whole families uh, being punished, right? Like, so think about Achan and his family, for example. So you see that in the Bible, but at the same time, you also see verses like Ezekiel 18.20, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father. So I, I think the scriptures are clear that we, are, we all are responsible for our own sin. So there is that individual element there. I think essentially what this is saying, or it's at least saying this, that the father's sins become the son's sins. And that's true even in our culture, isn't it? You know, like if, if, uh, uh, if a father is, is uh, setting a certain example for his kids, then uh, that's often going to be taken on by his own kids, his own children. And so the, the, the sins of the father are, are visited upon the the even the third and fourth generation. So it at least means that. But, but the main theme of this whole proclamation, uh, it, re it really does focus in on the, um, the grace of God. So, so we see it balanced out by his justice. But we see again, uh, the, the part that's repeated again and again is the Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And faithfulness. And so as we come to a close, uh, first, first of all, these last couple of verses, verses 8 and 9, we're going to pick up on those next week. So I just want to, I want to close uh, reflecting on this proclamation that the Lord makes. And I want to bring you back to John uh, 1, 14. So remember, John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory... Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we learn a couple of things from that. First of all, that we see the glory of God revealed in Christ Jesus. Indeed, and indeed even a greater way than what Moses was able to experience. But there's something else that we see here as we look a little bit closer. It says that, that Jesus was full of grace and truth. I, 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 love, I love that description of Jesus. Right? I mean, I think that really kind of describes Jesus in a nutshell. We, talk, we actually did a book study over, over grace and truth just this past summer. And how you know, we all want to, uh, as we are conformed to the image of Christ, we want to be people of grace and truth. But we see it uh, displayed for us in its fullness in Jesus Christ. So Jesus was full of grace and truth. Well... When we look at this proclamation in Exodus 34, it says uh, steadfast love and faithfulness. Understand, that could be translated grace and truth. So there's a parallel here between uh, God's steadfast love and faithfulness and grace and truth. And I don't think that's by accident, uh, because Jesus is 
the, the, the clearest and fullest manifestation of God. So, so sometimes we think of like the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament. Or we might even, we might even pit like you know, God is a God the Father against Jesus, God the Son. But, but we see that, that Jesus is, is revealing to us in a person what is proclaimed here in Exodus 33 or 34. Right? So, so when we see the character of God in a nutshell here in the Old Testament, we see that if you want to know who the Old Testament God is, you look at Jesus. And by the way, Jesus, he also is going to come and bring judgment when he returns. And so there is this balance, right? Uh, G- G- Jesus will come and judge the earth, but those who find refuge in him will be saved. But we see uh, Jesus, full of grace and truth, is displaying to us this steadfast love of God. And so, again, my challenge to you this morning is to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Now, Alex had a great song picked out for this morning, um, Rock of Ages, Cleft from me, let me hide myself in me. That fits the text really well, doesn't it? Uh, uh, Moses being hid in the cleft of the rock. But I asked him to change it uh, because of how I've incorporated this uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus in, into the text this morning. And so we're going to sing that uh, together. So go ahead and come on up, Alex. And, and as we sing this together, uh, I pray, I pray that, uh, uh, that you will mean it with all of your heart and that the Lord will uh, reveal himself to you in a special way. faithfully to this church and loves this church, and, uh, and Brian has been coming uh, now for probably a good month or so, and uh, the two of them are engaged, so uh, congratulations on that. Um, but, uh, uh, but Angela and Brian together uh, approached me just a few weeks ago and, and expressed a desire to become members, and so uh, just, uh, just this past week, uh, we met together, we had a good long talk, and uh, talked about, about their, uh, their stories, and, and they both uh, gave a profession of faith, and they've been, they've been baptized, and, um, and are trusting in Jesus, and so uh, I'm going to recommend them to you this morning for church membership, and so we'll begin with Angela, uh, and so all in favor of receiving Angela, would you raise your right hand? All opposed, same sign. Okay, now Brian, uh, all in favor of receiving Brian, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. All right, very good. And so, and so uh, we, uh, we talked about the importance of church membership, and I'm so glad that, uh, uh, that they're uh, interested in, in, in uh, taking part in that, and that now they are church members, and so that means that we uh, encourage one another uh, in the faith, and, and we, we hold one another accountable, and, and, and so there's, uh, we're part of the family, right? And so uh, I want you to welcome them into the family today. And uh, you can have that opportunity uh, right after I dismiss us with this uh, benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Amen.